that comes with the benefit of hearing my introduction, actually. Um, today, I want to talk about methods for dimension reduction and for embedding data, uh, also methods to analyze uh, manifolds that have intrinsic uh, low dimensionality. And uh, many of these are extensions of what you can normally do with a PCA. And uh, so this is a, an area of unsupervised learning. It's a very active area. So this has really changed, the field has changed while I've been watching it in the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, we will go all the way today from, uh, let's say, late 90s uh, or mid 90s to uh, I think 2008 is uh, the latest paper that I'm going to present today. And uh, some of uh, the derivations are actually, uh, I think, interesting or, or insightful. So uh, I want to start by uh, talking to you uh, about multidimensional scaling. Uh, and we will then discuss different uh, nonlinear dimension reduction methods. Uh, time permitting, at the end, we'll talk about uh, manifold regularization for semi-supervised learning. So, uh, multidimensional scaling can be used whenever you have only a dissimilarity matrix to start with. So, So usually we have uh, already a set of points and we want to uh, reduce or find a low dimensional representation for those same points. In multidimensional sp uh, scaling, however, you start with a set of dissimilarities and then you try to find a low dimensional embedding that uh, faithfully represents those original dissimilarities. So. Uh, given dissimilarities, the aim is to find an embedding where typically the Euclidean distances in this low dimensional embedding uh, shall reflect uh, those original dissimilarities. Such as the distances in the embedding match the original dissimilarities. Now, uh, to really find a faithful representation uh, is typically not possible. Uh, first of all, because you're trying to find a very low dimensional representation for a high dimensional phenomenon. But even beyond that, uh, sometimes it is just not possible to, to find an embedding that matches uh, those original dissimilarities. So uh, let me give you an example. Uh, consider the following dissimilarity matrix. So we have three points and the dissimilarity between the first and second point is one, and the dissimilarity between the first and the third point is two, and uh, the dissimilarity in between the second and third point is two, and each point uh, is similar to itself, so it has a dissimilarity of zero. So we can uh, try and do that geometrically. Um, such a dissimilarity matrix never gives you any information about uh, translation or rotation. So I'm, I will arbitrarily fix my first point here, and so I fix the translation. Uh, secondly, I will fix the rotation by saying that uh, the second point, I'm just going to draw it at a horizontal distance of one, because this is what my dissimilarity matrix prescribed. And then uh, the third point should be at a distance of two from the original point. So I know that my third point uh, lies somewhere here. And I also know that this third point should have a distance of two from the second. So 
So excuse my drawing. I think you see what I'm trying to get to. Okay, so uh, uh, that would be a distance of two. And uh, we now have uh, two possible solutions, so two points that satisfy all the constraints. So for instance, I could say that uh, my first point So I had three points overall. And I could say that this is my first point, this is my second point, and I could, for instance, uh, place uh, the third point here. Okay? So uh, this embedding of uh, first point, second point, and third point uh, matches those dissimilarities. Now, assume, for instance, uh, that we're now making this dissimilarity here larger. So we are uh, letting this grow, and as it grows, my solutions will shift. Eventually, there will be just a single solution left, and if I make uh, this, uh, this distance here too large, uh, or this dissimilarity too large, at some point, there will be no solution any longer. Uh, so then it's fundamentally impossible to faithfully embed this in Euclidean space, and, uh, well, you can then uh, trick around with the original dissimilarity matrix but this is an example where faithful embedding then uh, is no longer possible. So not all dissimilarities allow a faithful embedding in Euclidean space. In general, uh, there is a very large number of dissimilarities uh, you can uh, for instance, if the original data is binary, you can think of uh, different uh, coefficients. Um, so people, especially in chemometrics, have come up with a dozen coefficients uh, for binary data. For instance, the Hamann coefficient or Jacquard coefficient, the Mountford coefficient. Uh, essentially, all permutations of distances that you can invent have been invented. Uh, some of these are monotonic with respect to each other, others are really uh, totally different. Um, but more importantly, uh, people sometimes define problem-specific uh, dissimilarities. So, for instance, uh, when people try to align uh, proteins, they uh, have, uh, there is a measure that states how likely it is across evolution for one amino acid to be replaced by another. And uh, so uh, people in bioinformatics have uh, developed scoring matrices uh, where they specify the cost for exchanging one amino acid with another one. And you could use uh, such uh, specific distances that incorporate prior knowledge uh, of the field. In this case, uh, uh, how likely certain uh, uh, events are across evolution. Okay, now, uh, how, to, how to do this, uh, not graphically, but mathematically? Um, I will start by reminding what the squared Euclidean distance between uh, two vectors A and B looks like. out. And we can do the same for a full, uh, for full matrix of observations. So the matrix of squared Euclidean distances, uh, I call it capital D, and we've here looked at uh, elements uh, A and B of, of this matrix. Uh, and the reason I'm starting with this is because uh, that is, uh, let's assume that we are given as dissimilarities really squared Euclidean distances. So uh, if more generally my uh, data is arranged in a matrix in the following way, so let's say, uh, let's assume this is high dimensional data, 
So P would be the number of features and N would be the number of objects that we're looking at. So I'm using uh, this convention here. Then this matrix of squared Euclidean distances is given by, I'm now uh, taking each of uh, these terms here. So this is a vector that has uh, the distance of uh, or the norm of each of my original observations. And I inflate this vector such that to obtain overall a full matrix. So this vector here would be n by 1. And this is a vector of 1s. <coughs> dimensions 1 by n. So overall I obtain a rank 1 matrix uh, that is n by n. Then uh, the cross term here is x transpose x. And finally I have again a vector of 1s times that. So let's assume that these are the dissimilarities which we are given. So this is what we have and uh, the x, that's what we want. So we're trying to solve this uh, expression here for the x's. And it turns out uh, so that I can isolate uh, this matrix X transpose X as follows. Namely by multiplying from left and right with the centering, ma uh, with the centering matrix. So the centering matrix of uh, dimension n is the identity matrix minus where these ones are again vectors of all ones. And let's uh, look at that term first. So um, this is ah, I forgot to multiply from the left here with also CN. write it out in terms of matrices. There is the missing one. So now if I'm if I'm looking just at this bit here, this is um, the sum of 
uh, this is just one minus, and then uh, I have, uh, there's a transpose missing here. And then I have one transpose one. Those are vectors filled with one, so this is n. And I have one transposed. So overall, this whole thing here is zero. Okay, so uh, um, the first term, uh, so this whole term, uh, the first term after centering becomes zero. Uh, the third term will also become zero. So what I'm left with is this Cn x transpose x Cn. And So uh, this gives me a summation over all the observations uh, of all the coefficients of, uh, of all the observations. So in other words, this is n times mu, where mu is uh, the center of mass of my observations. Uh, and the uh, n will cancel, and this thing here, uh, simply uh, this multiplication with a vector of ones, repeats. This uh, uh, center of mass vector. So overall, what I have is And on the other hand, okay. Now, the center of mass, when I'm just given a dissimilarity matrix, I cannot say anything about the translation. So the center of mass, I can choose as I like, and uh, I'm free to choose or to set the center of mass to zero, and then I find that overall so in other words, when I set the, the mean to zero, then the centering or this double centering has no influence at all, and uh, this is what I'm left with. Now D uh, is the matrix of uh, squared Euclidean distances of my observations, which is given. Um, Cn is the centering matrix, and we know the definition of that, so that's also given. And uh, we can then solve for x uh, by diagonalizing. So I can say this is v transpose lambda v, where lambda is a diagonal matrix uh, holding all the eigenvalues. Or So this would be uh, the full embedding and the full dimensionality 
and this can now be truncated to its first few dimensions. So instead of taking all the eigenvalues and all the eigenvectors, I can take, uh, I can truncate after just the largest contribution. So we can truncate after the largest eigenvalues, uh, this uh, expansion here. Uh, depending on where the matrix really came from. So if, uh, if this really was the squared Euclidean distance of a set of points, then all the eigenvalues will be positive or zero. Uh, in reality, it can happen that some of these eigenvalues are negative. And uh, these negative eigenvalues you would omit because you know, if you take the square root of them here, you will end up with uh, imaginary coordinates and nobody knows what these are. So if there are negative eigenvalues, the sum of negative eigenvalues will tell you fundamentally how non-embeddable in a Euclidean space your, your dissimilarity matrix is. So if you have violations of the triangle inequality, for instance, this will uh, give in your original dissimilarity matrix, this will give you negative eigenvalues. Uh, so a couple of comments. What we've looked at here, sometimes also called classical MDS. Because other variants have been proposed. So if, if your dissimilarities really do come uh, from a Euclidean space, so if the, dis if the dissimilarities you get then uh, this will strongly remind you of uh, PCA, I think, right? Because overall what we do is we uh, diagonalize X transpose X, just as we did in PCA. And hence in this case, MDS just amounts to PCA. So in other words, if you have a very high dimensional set of points and you first compute square Euclidean distances and then do MDS on that, it's permissible, you can do that, but you just get out PCA, nothing different. Then I've mentioned this thing with the negative eigenvalues. If this doubly centered dissimilarity matrix, uh, if it still has, uh, negative eigenvalues, you, you can try and make it uh, positive semi-definite by adding uh, off-diagonal elements, uh, by adding a constant to the off-diagonal elements. Essentially, this means that you are inflating your, uh, your cloud of points. And in the same case here, if the dissimilarities are really Euclidean, then what this does is that it minimizes the sum of uh, the square deviations between the distances in the uh, original space and in the low dimensional space. So 
So in that same case here, MDS minimizes So the first d, those would be really the distances in the high dimensional space. And those would be the distances in the low dimensional space in your embedding. And other methods, uh, other than classical MDS, they start from this formula and then start weighing these terms and tweaking this formula to obtain different methods. Um, in particular, one, one such method is given by Salmon's nonlinear mapping where the task is to minimize and in that case uh, this is normalized by, uh, this should be D, this is normalized uh, by uh, the original distances or sometimes depending on the paper that you read also by the square of these Euc uh, Euclidean distances. So in other words, you, in your low dimensional embedding, you allow greater deviations uh, on those pairs of points that are at very large distances. So, let me write this more generally as a times a function, a weighting function of the original distances. And then why weight by the original distances? You could also weight in this low dimensional space. And in fact, this has been done in curvy linear correspondence analysis or component analysis. Where similarly, one minimizes the deviations between the original uh, dislinearities and the ones in your, the distances in the embedding, but this times but this time weighing by the distances in the embedding itself. And, you know, it looks very similar, but uh, this was shown to have much higher unfolding power. So uh, this was originally published in the 1960s. Um, this was in the 1990s. Uh, classical MDS, you know, if you look at it, this was in the 1940s and by the way uh, much of that early work was done in psychometrics and uh, really also many of the early important publications appeared in a journal called Psychometrica because uh, these were people who were first confronted with this kind of dissimilarity data so for instance when they were um, studying uh, you know, people liking movies or people liking each other, uh, you do not have an absolute description of a movie or of a person, but you can say that uh, uh, the judge number one uh, uh, thought that uh, uh, two movies were, you know, more similar to another than a different one and so on. So they, they really had dissimilarity data to start with and hence invented this multidimensional scaling. And uh, the earliest 
application that I know of multidimensional scaling. Uh, it's a very pretty one, I think. Um, this is uh, the Carta Marina, which uh, shows uh, part of Scandinavia. And this map was uh, produced in the 1500s. And it, it's, a, it's a large map, but it's also a great map. So uh, um, there's uh, lots of details to be gleaned. I think it's worth looking at it. So. Uh, Somewhere up there is uh, the Maelstrom, and uh, you also learn about uh, you know all the monsters in the uh, Atlantic and so on. Um, then uh, people hunting, so the wolves back in those days uh, hunting uh, reindeer, and now up here we have uh, uh, Sweden on the left and Finland on the right, and uh, you notice these people are crossing in a. In a, in a sledge. Huh? So uh, those were the days when it was still reliably frozen in winter and you could uh, cross the Botnik Sea. Uh, and then up there you have Eskimos hunting seal uh, and so on. So really a very nice map, uh, I think. Now, uh, there are only two uh, copies left in the world. Um, one of them is in the uh, library of the University of Uppsala. And uh, the, the guide because Uppsala University actually has a, uh, a guide for foreigners, uh, he told the story that, uh, you know, this was in the, in the days, of course, when, well, when distances were not reliably known. Uh, so he told the following story on, on how the map was produced. Um, there was apparently a handbook uh, for uh, people from the Scandinavian church uh, how much expenses they could claim if they wanted to go from one uh, community to the next. Yeah? So how many days worth of food and drink uh, they could claim by going from one place to the next. And uh, apparently um, the designer of the map used those distances uh, via multinational scaling, of course, to really you know, produce the uh, layout of, of this entire map. And uh, so I, I haven't found this in writing, uh, but uh, it, this tourist guide of Uppsala University, tourist guide is perhaps a derogatory term, he's really more of a historian. Uh, he's a very knowledgeable man and I, I take his word for it. So uh, early use of uh, multidimensional scaling. Good. Um, one of the variants of multidimensional scaling, I, I think I can still mention uh, before the break, namely uh, the isomap algorithm. Uh, this was uh, published uh, uh, back to back with another paper, uh, namely local li linear embedding uh, in Science uh, magazine in 2000. And the intuition is nicely shown uh, uh, in this example. So. Uh, uh, I think they first introduced the Swiss role as an example for uh, a nonlinear uh, embedding toy data set. And ever since, whenever somebody wa wants to publish an algorithm in that field, you have to show the Swiss role. So anyway, here you go. Um, so the original data has a nominal dimension of three, but an intrinsic dimension of two. Uh, so it, it's quite possible to unfold the structure into two dimensions and to reliably show at least the local uh, relations of points. Now, if in this high dimensional space, if you consider those points, the Euclidean distance would be this, but you can also try and estimate the manifold and then measure the geodesic distance. So the shortest distance uh, on the manifold between these two points, which goes uh, uh, all around here. And uh, the way this is accomplished is by first building a uh, nearest neighbor graph there are different variants of those graphs, but uh, so, so in essence, you find for each point its neighbors, uh, you create an edge uh, between these points, and 
then you ask, given this graph, uh, what is the shortest path from this point to that? And uh, there are algorithms that allow you to find uh, shortest paths in a graph efficiently. And after unrolling your, uh, well, in, in this way, you get a dissimilarity matrix, a dissimilarity matrix of estimated geodesic distances. And uh, given this dissimilarity matrix, you can finally do the multidimensional scaling that we've just seen, so classical MDS, to obtain an embedding like that. And uh, well, here the orders sketch what would have been the true geodesic distance indicated by the blue line, and then the approximate geodesic distance they found, uh, the red line. So, uh, you know, the idea is nice, uh, but perhaps you can think of practical problems uh, with this approach. Especially if the data, you know, this is now really a truly perfect manifold. What if the data is a little bit noisier? Yeah, so the, uh, um, he said the nearest neighbor in the high dimensional space need not be the nearest neighbor in the manifold. Uh, so uh, what happens, especially if this becomes a little bit noisy, is that your graph can short circuit. You can have uh, uh, among one of the k nearest neighbors a point up there, and then the shortest path would have gone that way, and you would not have been able to uh, you know, nicely unroll uh, the data as, as shown here. Uh, okay, similar uh, reservations apply to many uh, algorithms. But uh, isomap, nice though the idea is, uh, is particularly susceptible to such problems because uh, just a single shortcut or si a single short circuit uh, can mess up your entire projection. And there are other methods, uh, one of which we will, or several of which we will look at today. But, but in particular, diffusion maps, uh, they don't, uh, in, in diffusion maps, which we'll look at today, you don't look for the single shortest path, but you look, uh, at the average distance across all possible paths in a random walk sense to estimate the dissimilarity between two points. And that is a little less sensitive to uh, such uh, shortcuts. Okay, time for break. <laughs>